you're green and I'm blue. <laughs> you must be right. You can trade if you want, just to throw them off. Oops. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Robert McBride of All Classical Portland. Delighted to be here again. Thank you for that smattering of applause. <laughs> What you really want to do is applaud our guest conductor today, Pascal Tortelier. Merci, merci. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Who I had the great pleasure of speaking with last night and will again now and then again tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. Fortunate man that I am and fortunate ladies and gentlemen that you are, that you get to hear what this man has to say today and then get to hear the magic that he works on stage. Now, I would like to pose a question which comes to mind because of last night's concert. What do Pascal Tortelier, Billie Holiday, and Ringo Starr have in common? <laughs> Whoa. Okay, so, so they're all... For me? For, no, for just... Oh, yeah. You can make... No, 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 no. You, you tell me. I don't me. blame you, you at me. all. I had never thought about that. Well, but. I had neither until until the Ravel performance last night. There's there's this thing that some musicians in jazz and blues and rock musics do, which is to lay back and play or sing a bit behind the beat. Billie Holiday did that. Ringo Starr plays that way. And you did that in the Ravel last night. It's, it's a lively rhythmic piece that can fly by like running downhill if you let it. You didn't let it. Um, it is very in interesting, um, this approach to rhythm in music. I strongly believe that Rhythm, and even more than rhythm, it's about pulse. You know, life starts with a pulse. We True. know that. We all know that. And when I was a teenager, it's funny you talk about, you know, other kind of musicians, and I was fascinated, and I was totally taken by jazz. I, I had a real... Uh, a crisis uh, during my teenage and my father was even worried for me. He said, well, if this is really what you want to do, well, go ahead with jazz and for you, you are lost to classical music. I thought you were going to say you are lost to me, my son. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, nearly. He nearly yeah. said it. Wow. He nearly said it. Well, he, was, he could be tough, my dad. He mm -hmm. could be tough. But I couldn't help it. It was such a discovery. And you know the, the, the power of, of rhythm and pulse. I listen to so much jazz that probably it has left um, some you know some some stamp on me. And um, and I am not inventing anything because one of my greatest French colleagues, uh, colleague, uh, whose name was Pierre Monteux. Uh, one of the greatest French conductors uh, was once asked what's most important for a conductor and he thought seriously about it and after a moment of silence he said, well, um, tempo, you know what I mean? The tempo, that's the pulse. And then he said, the tempo and the tempo. <laughs> so, which is to say that in a piece, certainly in a piece like the Ravel Alborada, El Grazioso, the, the sense of pulse and rhythm is, of course, essential, like it is in all music, but it is featured, I would say. Yeah. In, uh, in Alborada, the, the, the sense of rhythm is featured, and as it is featured in Spanish music, more, even more so than in Russian music. I think mm -hmm. Spanish music has got the rhythm in, 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 in its blood. Uh -huh. The yeah. flamenco, the, the Flamenco is a good ex... Yeah, of course, oui. of course. And when you, when you describe me conducting a sort of slightly... What did you say? Behind the Behind beat. The beat. I, I am not aware whatsoever of doing that, but maybe it, it's, it implies that... In, in having a good rhythm, and every jazzman has got that kind of, you know, holding a bit, and it's a sort of, how can I describe it, coolness. Yes, it is. You see what I mean? 
Très cool. Coolness. Très cool. Très cool. I am très cool. <laughs> well, I'm not très cool. <laughs> but anyway, I think that's how we can describe it. So you were a violinist. Did you ever play jazz? Did you do a Stefan Grappelli kind I of thing? I wish I could. And when I hear Grappelli, uh, I, I just, I am in such a, I am in, in cloud nine, you say? Yes. Uh, I, I met the man, I met Grappelli, who started playing in, in, in Paris's uh, backyards uh, behind our, you know, uh, Paris is made of buildings. Uh, there, are, it's, there are no houses, there are all buildings, and be, between the buildings behind there is a courtyard. Uh, uh, and he used, you know, between the, between the two walls, I suppose he was a young man, he didn't have any money. So he would play just, you know, uh, tunes um, in, the, in the backyard of these buildings, and, and people would throw coins at, at him like that. He, that's how he started. And, you know, some great musicians have had very, very humble beginnings. Even Pablo Casals, the greatest cellist ever, Pablo Casals, he started in silent movies, playing in, in the pit for silent movies. My father did too. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. I Shostakovich used to do that, but I didn't well, know Casals yeah. did it. Well, it was, it, was, it was how music was played at the time. Yeah. Uh, you and know, your father, Paul Tortelier, one of the great cellists of his time, and a very fine conductor. And your mother was also a cellist. Your and sister is a pianist. So you and your sister and your dad had a piano trio. We did, yeah. And used to play things like the Ravel Trio, so your sister has to be a really fine pianist. Absolutely. Well, she would tell you how how challenging this piano part is in the, in the Ravel trio. I don't know if you are familiar with that piece. It's, it's the major trio of the 20th century. I listened this morning to your orchestration of that, which I hadn't heard no in years. Boy. It, was, <laughs> it, was, it was really interesting to hear. It sounds like Ravel did it. You just I totally, tried, I tried totally my best. It took that. me uh, several years, but uh, I decided that, you know, Play, playing this trio with my dad and my sister so often, you know, early in my life, um, we discovered that the piano part is so rich and uh, uh, so actually symphonic in, in, in stature and orchestral uh, that, you know, when I started, it was like a, a revelation. Uh, it started with, you know, some, some idiom at the beginning of the trio and it became clear that, you know, these would sound so beautiful with three flutes instead of a piano which, although it's the king of instruments, it is still a mechanical instrument. It is. And, uh, and to create the colors which French music uh, um, is, uh, how can I say, uh, so often championing, you know, French composers are really specialists in creating colors, think of Debussy and Ravel, they are probably the best. And uh, so I was looking at colors and the color for this music felt to me like it should be given to the flutes. And from that moment, I decided to orchestrate the whole thing. And that was a big challenge, but I have done it all around the world in the I past 20 ask years. I yeah. how often you had a chance to do it, or if orchestras would be reluctant to program that? No, they are not uh, reluctant. Uh, uh, if I am invited to conduct, it has often happened, and actually uh, it's my uh, um, colleague um, Michael Tilson Thomas here in America, who was the first one a good 15 years ago to ask me to do it in San Francisco. So I did the premiere in America in San Francisco, um, I, I wish I had been there. Mm, well, who knows? I may bring it here yeah. sometime. I would love to have you come back and do Bolero, because you're getting back to this tempo. Ah, The well. tempo is so important in that piece. Yes. And judging from what you did with Alvarado de Gracioso last night, I think you would just make it so sexy. I love, I love. <laughs> Dear. <Ooh. laughs> I think he would. I'm, <laughs> Anyway, uh, I was laughing out loud, by the way, at the end of Alvarado last night, <laughs> because it, it is so effective the way you the way you hold back and then you just well, I'm not going to say anymore, but it was just delightful. You know what? There is a tendency with um, today's world of, of doing everything maybe a little too fast. 
Everything's fast and loud. Everything is fast and loud, that's right, that's right. There is also another phenomenon, is that as you get older, and I am not the only one, you take a great conductor like Giulini, uh, and most conductors, when they get older, they change their tempi and uh, it gets slower. And so, well, I hope not too slow. Though. Yeah, not too slow. Because but the pulse is slowing yeah, the down. The pulse is everything. <laughs> is, everything is slowing down, you know. <laughs> but the bolero is a piece I take extremely seriously, which uh, is not always the case, and uh, and the challenge is really to drive it. Actually, it's um, it's it's a piece which needs to be driven, and there is tension from the downbeat to the last chord, which has to be um, uh, nourished somehow. Huh? Um, and, uh, and, and that's my challenge. I, I really like to drive the bolero from beginning to end, instead of uh, taking it like a, a lollipop, which just plays itself. Right. Because it's, in a way, it's easy to beat. But actually, it's challenging to play for the orchestra. And I want to bring as many features obviously orchestral features because it's all about orchestration. And mind you, this tune is phenomenal because don't take it for granted, this is a tune which has got uh, 32 bars. It's, it's a melody which runs over 32 bars. I hope I get it right. But that is to say, you know, uh, you take uh, Beethoven Pastoral and you get and that's all there is in the first movement of, uh, uh, of the first movement in terms of um, thematic material and he builds up with, based on this. That is really not much of a tune. It's a gorgeous line, a gorgeous idea. But if you take the theme of the bolero, it is my father, who was also a composer, used to say to me, it's one of the most difficult things for a composer is to write a theme and a melody that can last. You know, it's relatively easy to have just an idea right. of a melody, but then make it last. And there is also a beautiful example in Mendelssohn Violin Concerto in the second subject, second subject which everybody probably knows, you know, everybody, that itself is lovely. And that's it, because then he will repeat his original cell, okay, but then when we play, not finished. And then there was rock et cetera, et cetera. It's amazing to be able to create a melody which just goes on and on and on and on and on because melody is the oxygen of music. In Tchaikovsky, and we'll get to the Fifth Symphony, the second half of the concert, melody is, is everything in his music. It's, isn't it fun to watch his hands? Even when he's just sitting here talking, he's, he's conducting with these hands. And you don't use a baton anymore, at least you haven't been. When did you make that change? Some time ago, and uh, there is a very good reason for that. Uh, I, get, I got some feedback uh, from a major London orchestra, and uh, they were complaining that I was... Uh, I was doing too much with my body, with my baton, and uh, so I was, of course, I was not really pleased to, to hear that. And uh, because, you know, basically I have uh, quite a bit of, of temperament, so you don't want to, to add too much to eat. So I try to restrain myself, and I sort of boulez, who is exactly the opposite. Pierre Boulez is all, you know, he beats like a metronome. Uh, so, I decided maybe, you know, with this kind of long uh, limbs I have, uh, there was no need to make it extra long. <laughs> and I decided to be, you know, more, more to the point. And since then, now it's many years, I have been without a baton, but you know, there is no, uh, you know, great meaning in it. Uh, uh, I know that, um, what was his name, the conductor in Philadelphia? Um, who was uh, without a baton, uh, famous, um, you know, from uh, Walt Disney. Uh, 
Did Ormandy use a baton? No, before Ormandy. Before Ormandy. Yes. The there guy. was somebody before Ormandy in Philadelphia. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes. And he was so famous. Stokowski. Thank well, you Stokowski, very much. Stokowski, of course. Yeah. Yes. He... Stokowski yeah, was yeah, yeah. without baton. Right. And, um, and he was... Um, he was said that he obtained such an extraordinary sound from the Philadelphia Orchestra. Everybody knows that, the sound of the Philadelphia Orchestra. And maybe it's because he was sort of, you know, molding and, and shaping uh, and working on the sonorité. Mind you, Karajan also didn't use a baton uh, later in life, and uh, he was very good at sound making. Maybe there is, um, there is an advantage uh, in, 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 you know, in conducting without a baton, in that with your hands, and also because I was a violinist for so many years, I am, I am very keen on, on the sound I get from the orchestra. But sound, per se, means nothing to me. The sound emanates from what the music has to say, and I am not you know, obsessed with the sound I am making with an orchestra. I am, I am just animated with uh, the character and the meaning and the message and the content of the music that comes out of the score. Because really, to start with, this is pepper. You know, paper you throw it in a fire and it burns. Yeah. And just imagine, you know, what will be coming in a moment here on stage with these 90 wonderful players who are yours. <laughs> players from the, you know, from the, from the Oregon Symphony. We, I, I have enjoyed a beautiful week with them and I'm still counting on today and tomorrow and making some beautiful music. And this is the magic of music. You get some, it's on paper. It's like a play, it's like theater. It's just written on paper and until an interpret as such brings it to life, mm -hmm. it's dead. And there is so much magic in what musicians are able to do with the mechanical device, the piano, to make it sing, to make it liquid. Yeah. What conductors do, to make that music come off the page and come out of the hearts and minds and souls of all these people and, and resound in us. It's incredible. It's, it's, yes, it's a lot, of, a lot of things. It's both extremely uh, uh, difficult to explain to the point I am not sure I can explain it really. Uh, but at the same time, it's very simple. It's, it's about communication and waves and, 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 and what we musicians uh, are able to share it in common. So I don't want to sound too democratic here. Of course, the role of the conductor is to inspire. Uh, it is not just to secure an ensemble. Um, but the wonderful thing is that a conductor is playing with the most universal instrument of all. It is a live instrument. It's an instrument made of 90 players, basically. And, and the challenge, of course, is to get the players on your side. And there are different ways of doing it, and every conductor do it with his own blend of, of qualities, occasional faults, and you have got to correct your faults uh, all along your development in life. And um, so it is, uh, it is a beautiful experience to be a conductor. I had a little boy just a minute ago, I was talking to him, he's nine years old. And it's all wonderful, absolutely wonderful that he's keen to become a conductor. But um, that's one thing, to be keen to become a conductor at nine, but there is a long way to go, and it has to do, of course, with knowledge, musicianship, experience, and maturity. And at nine, uh, you have plenty of time. Uh, <laughs> certainly. Um, do you ever feel like you're running out of time? Uh, run, uh, no, I have never felt like that. Good. I am, to be honest with you, so many people have asked me, you know, did you find it challenging? And also being the son of a, of a great cellist, um, of course it created uh, some handicaps and, and, and some, uh, uh, you know, uh, backlash maybe. I don't know about backlash, but certainly some difficulty, some challenges. Expectations. Expectations, but at the same time it gave me so much 
so much in terms of musical heritage, of musical experience, having had such a father as mine. Um, I have never, ever had any uh, problem uh, with it. And even if my development as, as, as an artist um, is, is now uh, sort of paying dividends, uh, and I am nearly 70, so, you know, I don't have that much time ahead of me, I have no regrets, you know, uh, there, is, there is no secret, nothing like, you know, it's like wine, you know, a good wine takes time, and I honestly, uh, this week and all, all these times I am spending at my age with wonderful orchestras around the world is so gratifying and rewarding, even if it took so many decades until I reached that stage. Life is what you make it, kids, <laughs> and you're a good example of that. <laughs> Let's talk about Tchaikovsky. I had a realization during the performance last night of the Fifth Symphony by Tchaikovsky, which is going to sound really stupid because many other people will have realized this long before I did. Tchaikovsky's music is not about art. It's about the human experience. Yeah. It's about love and sorrow and aspirations and disappointments and tragedies and hope. And it comes through so strongly if you're open to it. And when someone like you and them offer it to us, it was so powerful last night and so beautiful and so life-affirming. Thank you. Well, it's so kind of you to say that. I, I do feel very strongly that uh, Tchaikovsky is, a, is, a, is a, not a unique composer in that regard. I mean, there are others, but he has attained uh, a level of, of expression and a way of touching uh, the listener with, uh, with his, well, you said it's not about art, but it's an art to be able to actually uh, translate it into music. Uh, that's, that's what geniuses are about. You know, uh, we, we have nothing to do with genius, we interpret it. Even if you take the, you know, the most talented conductors, violinists, or that. The genius is, in, uh, is proper to the one who creates. We only recreate. But the man who had the genius, precisely, to put those notes together and be able to make us feel all the emotions and the sentiments which he is uh, experiencing, that is what art is, great art is about, same in painting, you know, the, 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 the beauty of, of um, I am afraid I have to use the word art, the, the beauty of, of art with a big A, let's say, uh, is um, to be able to, to, to transcend beauty and, and to make you feel, uh, you know, the emotions and the sentiments. I think those are probably the, the, the most important uh, words and when it comes to Tchaikovsky, he's one of uh, one of the artists who succeeded best in doing that. Because if you speak to anyone in the street and you talk about music, probably Tchaikovsky is 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 the first name that comes. It's extraordinary how he has managed to um, to, to 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 bring uh, those emotions and share those emotions to us. So. Um, there is also something to do with Russian soul when it comes to Tchaikovsky, because Rachmaninoff, uh, in terms of melody, uh, has a lot to say, and he is also an amazing composer in, in, being, in, in his ability to convey emotions. This is about emotions, you see, and what happens is that, you know, you can have emotions with a very basic stuff, and a lot of the time that's what we hear mostly. So when I say basic, I don't want to be uh, uh, this, um, how do you say, um, derogatory. I don't, I don't want to say that, but it's just that, you know, you, you can create emotion with, with very uh, little, but, you know, it will remain uh, uh, quite, uh, you know, uh, you know, 
low brow. Simple, basic, simple, low, basic, yeah. low brow. And of course, the greater the, the genius, the greater the genius of the one who is creating uh, this uh, medium, whether it's music, painting, literature, uh, the greater the genius, the higher he will elevate the emotions. Am I clear? I think it's Very clear. fairly simple. Very clear. And but we, we can have really immediate emotions uh -huh. very quickly, very quickly. You know, we, we are made to have emotions, whatever it is. But <laughs> if we're willing to be patient and sit and listen to the grand journey of a big symphony like Tchaikovsky V, the experience is much richer than anything we could acquire. Yeah. instantaneously. And it's so ironic. Tchaikovsky was depressive, self-hating, suicidal, and yet when you walk out of here today, you're going to be convinced that life is oh. worth living because of what he wrote and because of what these people are going to bring to life today. And this is why we are so indebted to these geniuses. And something really, something special happened last night when I started the symphony you know, I was, I was told, you know, it would be nice if you said a few words. And occasionally I, I do it, but I get a bit nervous when I have to talk, except with you. I have to say I'm quite relaxed. And, um, and, and I decided not to talk. And actually, it doesn't s suit the beginning of the symphony very well to have some words before. It's a piece you want to start from, from nothing, because it starts from nothing. And the first chord... It didn't sound the same uh, the night before, but yesterday night, the first chord, I tell you, felt to me like, that's it. We, we have got the whole symphony in that first chord, just by the sheer concentration, emotional and technical concentration, and the whole feeling just uh, expanded from that E minor chord at the beginning of the symphony. And I think that's what this symphony really is. It starts from this E minor basic, you know, musical cluster. And, well, you will see what comes after. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. You're going to love this concert. Pascal Tortelier, ladies Merci. and gentlemen. Merci. Thank you. Very kind. Thank you. Very nice. Merci. Very nice.